good morning good afternoon good evening uh whatever you know time uh frame you know you are in in europe america or in africa uh my name is amanil tujua i have over 20 years of experience in accounting auditing and investigation i have a certification from u.s certified for examiner chartered accountant from uk cpa from usa i have obtained my master's degree in professional accounting from an accredited university in the United States. I, this is my sixth video you know, that I presented to you. I, I thank you, everybody who watched it, even if it is a very limited number. I thank you uh, to you, and I would really appreciate if you uh, like and subscribe my channel so that it gets to a lot of people. Uh, as you know, this, uh, this fraud investigation is a continuous course, as I have stated in my in my previous you know presentation i'll continue to you know dig into the detail and present this valuable information to you and when you think about you know investigation is not something that you just jump into it needs a lot of preparation and you know i'm giving you the the level work when it comes to you know getting into investigation and uh, uh again you know i will jump into the uh the material uh, the introduction, this presentation is to help you understand, you know, how we can plan and conduct the fraud examination. The presentation is divided into sections and will be presented multiple times on various subjects in fraud examination, you know, investigation. I have already, you know, uh, I have already presented, you know, five, you know, uh, uh, presentations in YouTube that I have posted. And I really appreciate, again, if you... You know, it's, you, you can watch it one time, but if you go and watch it in the second time, it sometimes it gives you a lot of information that you missed on, on your first view or watch. And uh, I really appreciate your help on that. And also, please remember to subscribe and like my channel. Collecting evidence. You know, when you, co when you talk about evidence, evidence is a broad, a broad, you know, uh, subject because evidence comes from a lot of direction we will concentrate on the major ones you know, the major the major ones but when it comes to evidence you know you need to think about how we collect evidence you know how we store evidence how evidences are you know getting from one hand to the other and you know how are we keeping all the trail of you know the 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 tracking the movement you know, of these documents. How are they changing hands from one person to the other, from one department to the other, from one organization to the other? How are they flowing? And to what extent are you know evidences are properly kept so that they don't get compromised? Because if any evidence that is compromised, it's worthless because it will defeat the purpose of you know presenting the very fact that we are we want it so we collect evidence to prove our case or disprove a case so remember that keeps that in mind it's always whether you are on for a case or against a case and you collect evidence you know that evidence collection has a lot of you know will you know most of the time you put your time money a lot of people get involved so uh making sure we do it right first time is a very important thing that's why i decided you know to give you this presentation and provide this presentation which i believe will help you know, a lot of you know investigators all over the world you know i'm you know in, in america in in africa in europe in anywhere in asia all over the world you know in, they, they can get you know, look into this it would give them an idea it would give them the basis of Oh, I was, you know, what kind of an evidence we call it. When you say evidence, sometimes it looks easy, but it is not. You get a piece of paper, so you have to know from who you get it, why you get it, and what is the intent of, you know, people providing you that kind of evidence. And this is what we will be looking into. Types of evidence. You will be looking at the major ones. Those are testimonial evidence, digital evidence, and documentary evidence. Let's look each individually. So the testimonial you know the testimonial evidences are ev that in evidences that involve statements made by witnesses neutral third parties and suspects during interview and or when testifying at trial these are we're talking about people here so people are you know giving you 
information. How do we conduct this, you know, testimony? How do we collect this testimony and evidence? There are a lot of roles. You know, how do we do it? How do we even approach a witness? A witness, what kind of witness? It is a calm and collected witness. It is a very educated, you know, very informed witness or a very emotional witness. How do we handle all this? You know, to what extent do we know if people are not deceiving us? You know, to what extent are people are truthful when they give us evidence? So these are the kind of things we'll look into detail. But the testimony and evidence, evidence that we get from witnessing people or from third parties. The second one is digital evidence. Digital evidence is consists of you know information stored in electronic form on on a wide array of you know, computers and storage devices by individuals and organizations. This is our laptops, our phones, our you know our and you know uh, you know our our you know our our you know storage devices like you know the these external you know backups of our devices and all that they have a lot of information and this anything that's in electronic form is a digital evidence again digital evidence very fluid and it is you know you would you have to know how even you get to there you get that evidence and the second thing is you know getting the evidence by itself you know it doesn't guarantee that you know you can use it you have to know how you get it from what source you get it and how you know to what kind of method you use to get it if, if it is a, a deceitful you know if you get you know evidence in a, in a deceitful way that's not going to work so these are the kind of things you know you need to take into account the third one we'll be looking into is documentary evidence this is the papers you know the papers and other things we get you know a, you know consists of records that help prove or disprove the existence of fraud you know or another relevant factor case this records might be created or maintained by you know the individual organization you know and then it, it can includes a lot of things you know council checks memoranda invoices ledgers letters means of you know meetings receipts and financial records you know and bank statements these are the 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 fraud exam examiner most of the time gives it these uh, you know a great deal of you know documentary evidence and it's very crucial that the uh, uh the fraud examiner you know sort out the relevant from the re non-relevant one the non-relevant one should be eliminated you know from the evidence collection you know the evidence you know the log or the evidence you know collection because they are, they are not relevant yeah so you know it main fraud you know examiners pay too much you know attention to documents it's important to remember that you know witnesses that who testify at trial are more important to fraud case than documents because this is a direct evidence that we're getting the testimonial is a direct evidence because they're talking about you know straight you know i saw this i saw that these are the testimonial and more heavy when it comes to you know uh telling the the fact in presenting the truth so we need to make sure you know what kind of you know weight are we giving to the types of evidences that we are collecting that's one area we need to look into um again you know while documents are you know important in gaining in giving a witness in the case credibility witnesses who spend too much time focusing on a document details often call confuse you know uh, and bore the fact finders that that's us that's the thing, you know, it's, it's too much document, you know, the, the jury, be it a judge, you know, they, it gets, it's very confusing. So we need to be very careful when it comes, you know, uh, doing, you know, those kind of things. Let's go to slide. The general rules of collecting documents. What are the, you know, they, there are general rules, you know, in court, basic, basic procedures in handling evidence are required for documents to be accepted or given you know much credence by the court otherwise it will be rejected so uh, proof uh, proof must be you know, provided that the evidence is relevant material and authentic remember material relevant and authentic otherwise the document will not be accepted or uh, will not be uh, credenced by the court the relevance of documents cannot be easily determined early you know in the case because there are a lot of you know things moving things in the course for the for that that reason and all possibility relevant document possibly relevant documents should be obtained because they need to be seen together and you know 
to so that it gives you know what kind of meaning in you know, what kind of direction they are leading us to and the other thing we need to, to look into is um you know how do you obtain documents obtain obtain documentary evidence uh, obtain originally the following you know journals are important in the collection of you know um evidences that at the first one is obtain documentary evidence documentary evidence can be obtained in a number of ways the preferred method is to obtain evidence by consent if both parties agree the preferred is consent if you will know when you will know why then that person will explain to you know the, their consent everything everything goes through in some cases you know consent can be oral but when information is obtained from you know possible adverse witness or the target of you know the examination it is recommended that the consent be in writing yeah it's very important you know because it is, it is the possibility of you know any kind of you know um dispute you know that you know writing will cover a lot of things if the party that requests you know the information on the and controls the evidence company and other employees then the investigator is usually able to obtain the documents as required because if it is for instance or if it's working for a company and there are employees who are supposed to give the evidence it's just writing email or sending you know a memo and you will get the evidence and the other uh, thing we we're looking into is category of evidences there are two basic categories of you know, admissible evidence direct and circumstantial direct evidence show prime face based on the first impression the fact is at issue it proves the fact directly what constitutes direct evidence depends on the factors involved for example in a case involving possible kickback direct evidence might be a check from the vendor or the suspect that uh, doesn't you know yeah, the suspect that doesn't correspond to a specific invoice or evidence direct one directly related we, if they talk about a check and presenting that check is a direct evidence you know and you know when you, you those are the kind of evidence we call direct so depending on the circumstance you know depending on the situation if they prove exactly to the point those are direct you know evidences yeah or oh, and and the other one is um circumstantial evidence evidence that tends to prove or disprove fact in issue indirectly by inference in the case of a kickback allegation cash depo deposits of unknown origin deposit to the suspect's bank account we, we're not talking about the check now we're talking about x amount being deposited to that that person account that's circumstantial it might be from other sources but we're saying there is an unknown you know deposit in their bank account so that's circumstantial so remember direct and circumstantial the other is organization of evidences you know keeping you know track of you know the amount of paper generated is one of the biggest problems in court case it is essential that documents obtained be properly organized early in the examination in that they can be continually or organized as the processes because this is very important because you know if you don't keep track and you know properly log our evidences we if we are not organized you know that will create a chaos and will lose track of you know the um, chronology as well as you know the sources of you know the evidences the other the other thing we'll be looking into is segregation segregate the documents in general documents should be segregated by witness or transactions in the former in, a, in the fraud examiner takes you know a list of names whether employees associate or witnesses a simple collecting of documents by individuals or tenant groups the fraud exam might find it easier to organize the information by grouping evidence of the same or similar transactions together during the evidence gathering stage you know a stage of the investigation organi organizing the documents chronologically is not recommend because it makes searching for relevant information more difficult if you keep on chronology you know that means we cannot even see the category that's what it's talking about you know understanding when we get it that's one thing but identifying and categorizing it by different categories the type of evidence that those are the direct evidences we have these are the circumstantial evidences we have from the direct evidences you know they can divide it by you know from employees from employers from third parties it's what kind of way of you know, categorizing segregating the documents 
the other one is make a key document file. Fraud examiner should make a key document file, a separate file that contains copies of you know, certain important pieces of information for quick access, for easy access to the most, you know, or to the most relevant documents, periodically reviewed by the key documents. You know, they have to keep a, a copy of the most key evidences, you know, then that, that's a very important thing in the fraud. More move the less important documents to backup files and keep only the most relevant ones in the main file. The most relevant one, you know, the one to keep. The other one, establish a database. You know, a database, you know, establishing a, deba a database clearly is the invest in the investigation in code all documents if there is a large amount of information to process. Otherwise, you will get lost, you know, in, the, in that, you know, ocean of, you know, information that we're getting, you know. So establishing a database is, is the most important thing so that, you know, the coding system, this database can be, you know, manual or comp computerized and uh, accessed by keyboards. The coding system should provide meaningful and comparable data. Therefore, the data, the, the, the database should at a minimum include the following fields of information. The date of the document, the individual from whom the document was obtained, the date obtained, the brief description, and the subject to whom the document pertains, which is very important. Maintain a chronology. A chron chronology of events should be commenced early in the case. The purpose of maintaining a chronology is to establish the chain of events leading to the proof. The chronology might or might be made part of you know, the format report. At a minimum, it can be used to, for analysis of you know, the case in place in a working paper binder. Remember, we said the catalog, we segregate documents by categories. Usually categorizing is not segregated, we don't do it by chronology, but maintaining a chronology is important. We need to write it when we get it, when we get that, when, so that we will know exactly what time frame we're talking about. You know. These are the kind of things you know, that will help you know, keeping the chronology brief and include all information necessary to prove the case. The chronology should be revised as necessary, adding new information and deleting irrelevant ones. And the last one we'll be looking at is keep a checklist. Another indispensable aid is a checklist of investigation objectives. The checklist, which might be updated frequently, should be kept in a, you know, uh, in a stockgrafer pad or another permanent you know, ring binder to allow a cumulative record. In a very complex case, this list can be broken into long, long and short term objectives. That is, you know, that which must be done if, you know, eventually. That is, in general, this is driving, uh, you know, the uh, investigation. What is our, you know, long and short term you know, objectives or the investigation itself? However, in you know, organized, some sort of, you know, list must be kept. Otherwise, important points will be forgotten in the lengthy case. Yeah, in the lengthy case. So we should always keep this in mind. You know, evidence collecting is very important. I hope, you know, I gave you some information with regard to this, and I hope you will enjoy it. Again, uh, my name is Amani Tujova. This is my sec uh, sixth uh, you know, video presenting to you. I really would like to thank you for listening and watching my, you know, presentation and video. Again, I would really appreciate if you subscribe and add, like, you know, my video so that it reaches to, you know, many people. Again, you know, this is my sixth one and I, I really appreciate any feedback, you know, so that I can, if there is any area that I, I need to improve, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you very much.